Today we're going to take a look at the Space Wolf Codex and talk briefly about their units and their warlord traits, stratagems, relics and powers. Hello and welcome back to War Specs Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. I thought that now that Saga of the Beast has come out, it might be a good idea to go back and take a look at the actual options from the main codex and have a bit of an overview and discussion now that we have those new rules and we can better see them in more context. In this video we'll talk about the special rules of the Space Wolves, briefly talk through their many many data sheets in this book and have a bit of a discussion as to which are the best stratagems, relics, warlord traits and psychic powers. There's quite a lot to cover, we will be mainly focusing on the main book this time, we have already done an overview of Saga of the Beast, so feel free to watch that after you've seen this one. In any case, let's jump right into it, with a look at the Space Wolves special rules. So first of all, the main special rules that the Space Wolves get from the book are Defenders of Humanity and Hunters Unleashed. Defenders of Humanity is our standard troop objective secured rule, and Hunters Unleashed is the main Space Wolves faction trait. It means that they all get plus one to hit on the first round of combat, any time they make a charge, were charged, or perform a heroic intervention, and those heroic interventions are far more likely to happen because all of their characters can heroically intervene six inches. The plus one to hit in the fight phase is really useful indeed. It'll basically mean a flat buff to basically any of your troops that don't already hit on twos. This synergizes absolutely amazingly with things that are minus one to hit, such as power fists and thunder hammers, as it provides a far bigger boost to the damage output of these things compared with things where you would have been hitting on threes anyway. It really incentivizes space wolves to go heavy on the thunder hammers and power fists, which is no bad thing in close combat. It means that their close combat units will generally hit like an absolute truck when they do connect with the enemy. The six inch heroic intervention is pretty handy for your characters. Space Wolves characters are one of the main parts of the army, with lots of scary fighty individuals trying to seek out their sagas. Now if this is a rule that there's a lot of counterplay to, your opponent will only ever trigger it if they do actually wind up putting their units within 6 inches of your characters at the end of the charge phase, so a lot of the time they might be able to avoid it. But there are going to be some times when you can't avoid it, if they want to charge one of your units then the character's radius might cover all of that unit, so they're always going to be able to fight, or perhaps if they need to be on an objective, they'll have no choice but to put them within your character's heroic intervention aura. It's a really nice to have sort of rule, which means that occasionally you'll get some free fight phases when you wouldn't have otherwise, but it is a bit random as to when that will actually happen. From Saga of the Beast, there's also the option to make any unit in heroically intervene on a 6 inches as well, which is a really good stratagem of Space Wolves, and also helps buff this heroic intervention threat. Talking of the Saga of the Beast book, their other special rules are there, their Angels of Death, which gives them bolted discipline, the double shooting at long range if you stay still, or if you're a back or terminator, firing with storm bolters or twin bolt guns or things. They gain shock assault, which is an extra attack on the first round of combat as well, meaning that they're just massively, massively more fighty on that, with plus one to hit and plus one attack. Combat doctrines for extra AP on all their weapons. Most wolf players will generally be wanting to rush through to their assault doctrine, which will give them an extra AP when they hit with those thunder hammers and things, typically meaning they could be AP minus four with thunder hammers and power fists. Their assault doctrine is also further augmented, and it's called Savage Fury which gives you an additional hit on every roll of a 6 that you roll for a hit roll in melee. All this can stat to mean that you absolutely do not want to be in any sort of combat with Space Wolf units. Even the most lightly armoured of them will absolutely tear a hole in the enemy lines, and doubly so on turn 3 or later. Next, let's take a look at the unit list as an overview. The Space Wolf Codex is incredibly character heavy compared with most other books. They've got an absolute ton of named characters and quite a lot of options for their generic ones as well. From named characters, Arjak Rockfist is incredibly fighting, a really competitive choice for the Codex. He has a powerful hammer weapon that he can also throw. It's minus one damage when the enemy attacks him. He gives the Wolfguard battle leader lieutenant style rerolls to wound and also gives plus one attack to Wolfguard. He's a really good value character. Beyond the Fell Handed is a sort of Captain Dreadnought hybrid, as he gives an aura of reroll ones to hit. He moves 8 inches, he's very hard to kill, and can also pack some powerful ranged weaponry. Again, he's a really strong character, not too bad for his points cost, which is around about the 180 mark or so, depending on exactly what war gear you give him. Canis Wolfborn is a 100 point character on a Thunder Wolf, armed with a Wolf Claw. He can reroll charge rolls has the standard wound roll reroll for battle leaders, and debuffs nearby wolf units by giving them plus one attack with teeth and claws. Harold Deathwolf is another Thunderwolf mounted character. He has Glacius, a boosted frost axe. He can outflank. He gives captain style rerolls, boosts the morale of wolves and thunderwolves, 
and gets plus one to save from his mantle of the troll king. Chrom Dragon Gaze is a cheap little HQ at 75 points. He has Worm Claw, again a boosted Frost Axe, and has a minus one leadership aura if you're looking for a very cheap Wolf Lord. Then he's a really solid pick as he gets his fighty close combat weapon included basically for free over a standard Wolf Lord. We have Iron Priests in here as well. These ones cost 67 points in total. They're armed with a Hellfrost Pistol and Tempest Hammer. And again, point for points, they're actually really quite good in a fight, despite being a Tech Marine equivalent that's mainly focused on repairing vehicles. The Tempest Hammer is basically a Thunder Hammer, which has the Hellfrost rule, which means that you could take an extra mortal wound. Logan Grimmar, the Great Wolf himself, can be fielded either on foot or in his Storm Rider sleigh. He's exceptionally fighty with 5 attacks and 7 wounds, or even more if he's in Storm Rider. He's the character that gives you reroll or failed hit rolls, as opposed to just reroll once to hit, as a lot of the characters have. And he fights with the powerful Axe Morkai, which is just as strong as a Thunder Hammer. Storm Rider's a little bit bigger, a bit more durable, but also directly targetable, so the enemy can just gun it down with anti tank weapons, unfortunately. Now, Stormcaller is a boosted Rune Priest. He costs around about 120 points, varying slightly as to whether or not you give him his Terminator armor. He can cast and deny two powers a turn, and he can add one to his psychic test, so it's just that little bit more reliable when he's casting. He's a pretty decent choice if you do want some powers of the Tempestor's discipline on the table. Ulrich the Slayer is a named Wolf Priest, he's 85 points, and he currently allows Space Wolves to reroll hits in the fight phase when they're near him and he has some healing balms which could allow him to heal a character nearby him. Unlike the other wolf priests, his data sheet wasn't updated in Saga of the Beast, so he's still going by the old style chaplain rules and doesn't get the new litanies. Finally for named characters in this section we have Ragnar Blackmane, but his data sheet was updated when the model was to Primaris, that's now found in Saga of the Beast, and is ludicrously dangerous, with getting 10 attacks on the charge with his Frostfang Chainsword, as well as getting reroll charges too, and he really punches above his weight at 120 points. In terms of non-named characters, we have a whole slew of Wolf Lords, you can get a Standard 1 in Power Armor, a Primaris 1, a Terminator 1, Thunder Wolf 1, Gravis 1 and Cataphracti 1s. Standard 1s and the Terminator 1s and the Thunder Wolves are the ones that have the most options available. The others are just a little bit more limited. They'll provide you your standard reroll ones to hit Captain Aura, as well as being very fighty in their own right. Wolfguard Battle Leaders are the Space Wolves equivalents of Lieutenants with their reroll ones to wound Aura. You can get standard Primaris, Terminator, or Thunder Wolf ones, and they're often the go to for an actual fighty character as they can take Storm Shields, which means that they can be just as tanky as Wolf Lords and cost a little bit less. From Saga of the Beast, the Wolves also gained the Wolfguard Battle Leader, Lord, and Rune Priest in Phobos armor, and has the Wolf Priest and Terminator Wolf Priest data sheets updated so they can cast litanies as well as perform their healing duties. Moving on to the troops of the Codex, from this book we have Grey Hunters, Blood Claws, and Intercessors. The Grey Hunters and Blood Claws cost 60 points each at their smallest squad size, so it can be quite good for filling out battalions. The Grey Hunters are kind of your standard tactical marine style equivalent, but they can take a bolt gun and chainsword, which means they get additional attacks compared with those at standard. The Blood Claws are sort of the equivalent of scouts, but in power armor. They're equipped with bolt pistol and chainsword, but they only hit on fours with the bolt pistol, though their weapon skill is still 3 plus. They get an additional attack on the charge thanks to their Berserk Charge special rule, although they must do this if they have the option to, if they're not accompanied by a Wolfguard pack leader. Talking of that, both units can be accompanied by a Wolfguard pack leader, who can take some Terminator armor to tank for the units, and can also bring other powerful melee tricks to the squads. Intercessors are certainly a powerful choice in a new Space Wolf list, due to the amount of strength 4 attacks that they can get, and the fact that you can now take Thunder Hammers on the Sergeants, which isn't too bad, hitting on 3s with 4 attacks on the charge. We've also now got the option of Infiltrators and Incursors from Saga of the Beast, in particular the Incursors are interesting, as they're not bad in a scrap with those paired combat blades. For transports, we have the standard Drop Pods, Rhinos, Razorbacks, Repulsors and Landspeeder Storms, and also access to the Impulsor in Saga of the Beast. Drop pods can be great for getting things like Wolf Guard to the front lines, potentially right from turn 1, which is certainly nice, and he could implement some sort of Rhino Rush kind of tactic for Grey Hunters or something. The Impulse is also a really interesting choice, and I think you can certainly make some scary lists with 6-man squads of Intercessors with Thunder Hammers in Impulses, and maybe throw Ragnar Blackmane in one for additional nasty melee surprise. Moving on to the Elite section for the book, again it's a very big section, as is quite common with Space Marine Codexes. Wolfen are pretty much the all-stars of the Space Wolf Elite section. Their two wound models with a 5 plus feel no pain, which makes them quite tanky, and they can all take storm shields and thunder hammers, meaning that they can be really quite resistant to enemy fire and absolutely break whatever they touch in close combat. They move 8 inches, they can advance and charge, 
and they can allow other space walls to reroll charges within 6 inches of them, so it can even be a good buffing unit, and once they're in close combat, they can trade that buff out for additional attacks. As if that weren't enough, when they're in close combat, if a model dies, then they can immediately fight again due to their death frenzy rule, meaning that you can very rarely clear these out efficiently in close combat. The enemy is likely to take a significant amount of damage doing so. They're a really scary unit, and make use of the Space Wolf buffs some of the best units in the Codex. I think aggressors are also pretty decent for using the Space Wolf buffs. You can outflank them with the Stratagem, they have a whole ton of anti-infantry firepower, and those Power Fists will also be great when paired with plus one to hit, and all of the other Space Wolf combat buffs. Reavers can also be good getting in some close combat attacks, and they can come out of Deep Strike. Could be worse as a disruption type unit, but they don't quite have the raw hitting power of things with Thunder Hammers. You've got Servitors to accompany your Iron Priests, and Wolf Scouts in this section as well, who sadly are kind of subpar to their standard Space Marine Scouts equivalent, because they trade out their forward deployment that's so useful for an outflank maneuver to get them behind enemy lines. Don't get me wrong, they can certainly bring some melee threats where they're least expected, but it's just nowhere near as powerful as being able to take the midfield straight from the turn 1, and potentially even go for the first turn charges. If they do want to make themselves a bit tougher though, then they can take a Wolf Guard Pack Leader, who can take fancy combat equipment if they should want. Up next we have our Wolf Guard and Terminators, these are an incredibly flexible unit, can basically take any of the Space Wolf melee and ranged options. The standard unit could go in a drop pod, or they could even take jump packs to help get them to grips with the foe very quickly, and they can also take the very nice Storm Bolter and Storm Shield combination, which not many chapters have access to. The Terminator Wolf card can also take this very nice combination, so you can have some ridiculously tanky Terminators, shielding hits for some melee specialists with Thunder Hammers or Cyclone Missile Launchers, and I honestly think that they're one of the better Terminator units out of the whole game at the moment. You can also get Cataphracti and Tartarus patterns, that are still very good. The Cataphracti get better defence, and the Tartarus get a bit more movement, but they don't get the same raw flexibility as the Wolf Guard Terminator squad. Up next we have a whole ton of Dreadnoughts, there's the standard one, unchanged from Codex Space Marines, the Venerable Dreadnoughts, who can take the interesting options of Wolf Claws and Frost Axe and Blizzard Shield. I quite like the Frost Axe and Blizzard Shield, as it gives them a 4 plus invul for walking up the board in a very tanky way that's hard to remove. There's Murderfang here, who's a character Dreadnought for 125 points, that has very very strong damage output, but doesn't really do much else for your army. We've got the Contemptor Dreadnoughts, not the 4 to one this is just the one with the options for Multi Melters and Assault Cannons. We've got the Wolfen Dreadnought, who has to take one of the Blizzard Shield or Wolf Claws options from the Venerable one. They get a bit of a buffed movement with 8 inches, and can also re-roll charges, so they're just a bit likely there to get there. They don't hit on 2s like the Venerable Dreadnought though, though Hunter's Unleashed does somewhat make up for that. Finally, we have the Redemptor Dreadnought, and the Invicta Tactical Warsuit that was added in Saga of the Beast, both of whom certainly do well with Hunter's Unleashed, to get them to hit on 2s in close combat. There's also a few characters in the Elite section, there's the Ancient and Primaris Ancient, the ones that allow you to get extra attacks when you die, there's the Great Company Champion, and there's Lucas the Trickster here as well, who's an 80 point little character with a damage 2 Frost Claw, he's hard to hit with minus 1 to hit from his Pelter the Doppelganger, buffs Blood Claws with reroll wound rolls of 1, and if he dies in close combat, he has a chance to inflict d6 mortal wounds on the enemy with his Stasis Bomb. Bit of a shame he's not an HQ really, as it would be helpful if he could fill battalions. Moving on to the fast attack section, we have the Fenrisian Wolves and Cyber Wolves. Fenrisian points are 6 points a model, and he can have up to 15 in a squad, and they attack with a flurry of teeth and claws, which is strength 4 AP-1 attacks. They can be somewhat useful as screens, though they aren't the most durable. Cyber Wolves are 15 point models, and you can have up to 5 of them in the squad. Their augmentations give them a 4 plus save and 2 wounds, so a little bit tankier, but they do pay a points cost to reflect that. They can be quite good as brigade fillers, as you can just include one Cyber Wolf for only 15 points. Next up we have Swift Claws and Swift Claw Attack Bikes. These are sort of equivalents of Blood Claws, so they hit on 3s, but only hit on 4s in the shooting phase, and they do get the Berserk Charge for an extra attack on the charge. This means that the Swift Claw Bikers are a little bit more of a melee threat than bikers normally are, but only hitting on force with Ballistic Skill really isn't great for their excellent twin bolt guns, who are usually really quite efficient anti-infantry fire. It's particularly unhelpful for the Swift Claw attack bikes, which this means they'll usually be hitting on fires with their heavy weapons, meaning that they're just not very efficient as a unit. Wolf Scout bikers have somehow escaped points reductions given to standard scout bikers, meaning they're just far too expensive for what they do, though they do get the behind enemy lines outflank style special rule that standard Wolf Scouts do. Sky Claws are perhaps a little bit more interesting. 
These guys are basically Space Marine Assault Marines. Again, they have the Blood Claw special rules, meaning they only hit on 4s with their Ballistic skill, but 3s with their Weapon skill, and get their additional attack due to Berserk Charge once they make successful charges. This does mean they're actually at a half decent output of Strength 4 attacks, though I'm not sure that they compete amazingly with the flexibility that you can get from Jump Pack Wolfgarten. Thunderwolf Cavalry are probably one of the most iconic units in the Space Wolves range now, and they're here in the fast attack choice as well. They can be very threatening and at least reasonably tanky when they're giving Thunderhammer and Storm Shields, and their Thunderwolves also get additional attacks on top of that. They have three wounds apiece, so certainly aren't going down easily, but their cavalry keyword can mean that they don't interact amazingly with ruins, which can be somewhat problematic. In addition to these more unique options, we also have Inceptors here, standard Space Marine land speeders, and suppressors from the Saga of the Beast book to round out the fast attack section. In terms of flyers, we have the Stormfang, Stormwolf, and Stormhawk Interceptor. We don't get access to the Storm Raven or the Storm Talon. The Stormfang is the gunship version, which packs the mighty Hellfrost Destructor, which acquired an excellent new stratagem in Saga of the Beast, which for one command point can turn it into a fairly efficient tank hunter. The Stormwolf is more of a troop transport sort of ship, it can hold a mighty 16 Space Wolves, so it does mean that you can get a large portion of Wolves right up into the enemy's face. Of course you do risk the chance of it being shot down either in your own deployment zone or right next to the enemy. The Stormhawk Interceptor competes very well as a gunship against flyers, and basically just does what it would do for any other chapter. Now we get to heavy support, we have a few of the more standard options such as Hell Blasters, Hunters, and the Land Raider variants. The Land Raiders could be interesting for transporting some Space Wolves up the board, but as usual do have the downside of potentially being locked in close combat and unable to shoot if they move up, which has been their Achilles heel since the start of 8th edition. And we've got the standard Space Marine tanks in the Predator, Stalker, Vindicator and Whirlwind, and Eliminators and Repulsor Executioners have also added in Saga of the Beast. The only real unique Space Wolves choice in the heavy support section are the Long Fangs, the Space Wolves unique Devastator squad. They can reroll hit rolls of one just as base against one target, and have a couple of handy stratagems from the Space Wolves stratagem section, and they can take a Terminator pack leader to potentially tank some wounds for them. On the downside though, they can't increase their squad size above 6, which can be a bit problematic as you start to lose heavy weapons quickly. So talking of stratagems, let's go through a few of them available to Space Wolves. There's a whole bunch of one command point ones, including Killshot, the Predator one that was axed from the main Space Marine Codex, meaning that Space Wolves, Dark Angels and Blood Angels are the only ones who get that. So if you still want Killshot Predators, this is one way to get it. They have True Grit, which is an infantry upgrade, which can allow them to fire their bolt guns, bolt rifles and auto bolt rifles, as if they had the pistol 2 type weapon, meaning that you could potentially surprise your foe with a flurry of bolt shots when they thought they were safe in close combat. Flak Missile is the one that can do D3 mortal wounds to planes with a missile launcher. Seeking a Saga is actually a really powerful one, and it's basically activated when your Space Wolf character fights a unit that's got a higher power level than it, it gives them rerolls for failed wounds, which is actually really powerful, and can make things like Ragnar Blackmane's strength 6 attacks go absolutely through the roof, and doubly so when combined with the Touch of the Wild stratagem that gives them a bunch of extra attacks from the Saga of the Beast book. This little combo, when you can pull it off, will basically make any Space Wolf character put a ludicrous amount of damage on an enemy threat. I think that this is one of the best stratagems in the book. The next one is one command point for the wolf's eye, and this is the long fang one I talked about. It basically gives you reroll to wounds with the long fangs. This is absolutely excellent if you combine it with some heavy weapons such as missile launchers or las cannons, particularly as they can typically already reroll ones to hit due to their own special rule. It's a really powerful upgrade, and makes them one of the standout devastator squads in the 40k universe at the moment. Next up we have Overwhelming Impetuosity, which is the Blood Claw stratagem. This one's one command point to reroll hits for the Blood Claws against one given unit. Could potentially be a lot of extra damage if you're charging with a full unit of 15 of them. Could be the difference of 10 extra strength 4 attacks in ideal circumstances. Next we have Talismanic Shield, which is a decent anti psyche stratagem, and it's the one command point allowing you to get a Deny the Witch test for one of your Space Wolf characters, which really can make all the difference if you just need to have some threat to stop your opponent getting that one key psychic power through. Another very reasonable option. Next we have Wisdom of the Ancient from the main codex, reroll ones near a Dreadnought, Armor of Contempt for ignoring mortal wounds, Hellfire Shells for dealing some mortal wounds with a heavy bolter, and Trophies of Fenris, the one that can get you extra relics, one command point for one extra relic, and three command points for two. Living Storm is a one command point one that only works if you have three Rune Priests next to each other, and it only slightly buffs Living Lightning, so in all honesty this one's a bit rubbish. 
cunning of the wolf is that one to allow a unit to outflank and basically come in within six inches of the board edge on turn two or turn three. This is amazing on things like Wolfen, though it could be great on aggressors or other units like units of Wolfguard as well. Pretty handy to guarantee a charge roll, even if that is a 9 inch charge. Next up we have Mentor's Guidance for one command point. This one's a stratagem that you can use when you're nearby a Wolf Priest and you have a character fighting, and that character can reroll all wound rolls. Again, reroll wound rolls is really powerful on Space Wolf characters in melee, though this one's a little bit harder to set up as you do need your Wolf Priest nearby as well. Next we have Datalink Telemetry, this is the one that coordinates land speeders and whirlwinds to make the whirlwinds auto hit. I'm not sure this is necessarily worth all the setup of having land speeders and whirlwinds about, but if you have them anyway it could be handy. Keen Senses is a really good Space Wolf stratagem that actually boosts their shooting phase decently, as it means that a Space Wolf shooting unit doesn't suffer any penalties to hit rolls via enemy modifiers. This is particularly good if you have things like Eldar Flyers or silly stacking buffs like Chaos Possessed being minus 3 or minus 4 to hit. Could be handy for having a repulse executioner or some long fangs power through a bunch of shots. Lone Wolf is a really fun and potentially really powerful stratagem. You activate it when you have one member of a Space Wolf's infantry squad left, and that unit immediately gains two wounds, gains the character keyword, and most importantly, it can reroll hit rolls to hit and wound for the entire rest of the game. This is crazily powerful if you can pull it off on a Terminator pack leader, as it means that they really will be punching with all the weight of a full-fledged Space Wolf character, which is usually a very scary thing indeed. Next we have the Emperor's Executioners, which is the one for fighting Thousand Sons, and you get extra hits on the roll of a 4+, plus if you're against their most hated foe. We have Laugh in the Face of Death, which allows Space Wolves that are affected by a minus 1 leadership modifier to re-roll all hit rolls for a fight phase to get a little bit more damage out again. Line Breaker Bombardment, the Vindicator stratagem where you need three of the things, and swap out their damage output for a whole bunch of mortal wounds. Generally not the most worth it in my opinion, but it's not an option that's available in the Space Marine Codex anymore, so it does have its interest. And finally, Overwhelming Savagery that you use in the fight phase for Thunderwolves, and just gives them a flat reroll wound rolls of one. Could be worth it if you're using it with a big unit. Next up, we have the two command points one, which there's only a few of. The first is Howl of the Great Pack. This one's done by a wolf lord, and it means that nearby space wolf units automatically pass morale test this phase, and enemy units must add one to their morale test taken, presuming they're within 12 inches. For me, with and little no no fear, this one's unlikely to be worth the massive two command point investment. The other unique space wolf two command point one is Chooser of the Slain, and this one's a sort of intercept type ability that you have when a space wolf unit is within six inches of a rune priest. It means a single friendly space wolf unit can fire a shooting attack when they're within six inches of the rune priest when an enemy unit comes in from deep strike reserve. This could actually be incredibly powerful, particularly when combined with some of the bigger shooting options. If you're running something like a repulsor executioner in your space wolf list, then it could well be worth including a rune priest for this alone. Getting extra shooting phases out of that thing is crazily powerful. Finally, we also have Only in Death Does Duty End, the one where Space Wolf characters can fight when they die. It's excellent on the normal Space Marine Codex, and it's absolutely excellent here, as Space Wolves tend to have even more fighty characters than is the norm. Finally, we have for 3 CP, we have the Orbital Bombardment one, the one that can throw a few mortal wounds around once it's called down by the Wolf Lord. And Honor the Chapter, the time-honored favorites for fighting again, which again with Space Wolves is usually excellent value due to the high power of their close combat units. Their unique one is Cloaked by the Storm, and this one's called by a Rune Priest after he uses a psychic power, and it basically gives him a 6 inch aura of minus 1 to hit for nearby Space Wolf units. Now this is a really great ability, and it will genuinely keep Space Wolf units a bit safer as they move up the board, particularly if you have some other source of minus 1 to hit, such as Rhino's smoke launches or something. The biggest issue is the 3 command point cost, which is certainly very steep, and it will preclude you from using others of these fun stratagems in-game, so you do really have to think about whether or not it's worth the opportunity cost. Again, from Saga of the Beast, there were a ton of new stratagems added. I won't go through all of them again here, but some of my favourites were Touch of the Wild, the one command point character one for getting extra hits on force, which is almost an also include every time you make contact with a character against a scary threat. There's one that allows the Space Wolves to make 6-inch heroic interventions with any of their normal units, which means that the opponent has to keep away 6 inches from every single Space Wolf unit unless they want to hit, get hit by Frost Axes and things. Duty Eternal to make their Dreadnoughts that bit tougher and Transhuman Physiology, which can help keep Wolfen, Wolfguard, Thunderwolves and characters far more resistant to heavy weapons. If we move on again, then we'll take a look at the Warlord traits for the Space Wolves. These are the ones that were heavily updated in a Day 1 FAQ for the Codex, basically changing them from single character abilities 
to turn them into 6 inch auras whenever they achieve their deed of legend. Although this can be a bit of a weakness for the space wolves because it means that they don't get powerful character auras that affect nearby troops right from turn 1. First up we have Saga of the Warrior Born. This allows the character to fight first in the fight phase, unless the enemy has a different similar special rule. I find this one not the most useful to be honest, because the enemy can still fight first if they've charged you, and you'd normally be fighting first if you've charged. So in the vast majority of first turn combats, it's not actually going to make all that much difference if it's crucial. It does help out if you're in protracted combats, but for me that's not really enough for it to be taken on a warlord trait. You also have to slay a character as your deed of legend, which isn't impossible, but it's certainly far from guaranteed. Next we have Saga of the Wolfkin. This gives your warlord an extra attack in the first round of close combat, so it can synergize quite well with Savage Fury if we are looking to build a very fighty character. And if you slay 5 models in cumulative fight phases, then that can become a 6 inch aura, which is actually really quite decent if you want to be buffing up your nearby units. Realistically your character is likely going to have to have to fight a couple of times before this happens though, so it is a little bit of a gamble if they make it or not. Next we have the Saga of Majesty, this one's auto pass morale, and you get plus 3 inches to your aura abilities. This one's one of the most common ones to be taken, Logan Grimnar gets this one, and it means that he can have a 9 inch aura on those very nice reroll or failed hit rolls. The Deed of Legend is laughably hard, and you have to slay the Warlord with your Warlord, which frankly if that's happened then the game's going very well indeed, never mind if you've actually used your Warlord to manage to slay them. If that ever does happen though, then it means that his aura can actually buff the auras of all other characters nearby, which could be quite fun, but it's fairly unlikely to happen, so I'd just focus on the plus 3 inch aura bits that you get from this. Next up we have Saga of the Beast Slayer. This is plus 1 to wound rolls against monsters and vehicles, and this one really is quite a decent buff to close combat when you're fighting these targets. Ulrich the Slayer gets this one if you want to choose him as your warlord, but I honestly think that this one's probably best on something like a wolf guard battle leader or wolf lord with thunder hammers, as it really puts their damage output significantly higher against vehicles and monsters. It could be a reasonable one to buy in with Hero of the Chapter if you're fighting an army with lots of monsters and vehicles. If good things happen and you do manage to slay a monster and vehicle with this warlord, then this is actually really pretty savage as an aura buff, as it means even your bolters could be wounding things like Imperial Knights on fives, never mind all the Space Wolf close combat goodness, so it gets very powerful indeed if you do manage to kill a monster or a vehicle. Next we have Saga of the Hunter, which allows you to charge even if you're advanced, and it does mean that for any ground based thunder wolf or jump pack type wolf lord, it means that you'll have a much bigger threat range on your melee. Again, not an unreasonable pick for a smash lord who wants to be going off and doing his own thing, or maybe running up alongside some wolfen who have a similar rule. It has one of the easiest deeds of legend, which is just to successfully charge an enemy unit with your warlord. Unfortunately, it only becomes an aura in the next phase, so you can't successfully charge a target, and then also apply the aura to nearby units that advanced, which would have been some nice synergy. Finally we have the Saga of the Bear, this one's basically a 6 plus feel no pain type save against lost wounds, so a minor durability buff for your character. Arjak Rockfist gets this one, and if you pass a successful saving throw with the model, then it becomes a 6 inch aura, which could actually be a pretty decent upgrade to some nearby Wolfguard Terminators or Thunderwolves for example. With durable characters like this, it is likely that you are going to pass some saves, so provided you manage to make combat with them, and the enemy gets to strike back at least once, you could be looking at quite a nice 6 plus feel no pain aura. Overall, I do think that the Deeds of Legend make it very problematic trying to unlock the best abilities, and it's quite rare that you're going to be easily achieving them without a bit of thought in any one game. I quite like the Saga of Majesty for the increased auras, and I really like Saga of the Beast Slayer for a fighty warlord, and just putting through a whole load more damage on vehicles and monsters. I can see uses for the extra attacks from Wolfkin, the advance and charge from Hunter, and the feel no pain from Saga of the Bear, but I pretty much never take Saga of the Warrior Born, I just don't think it adds very much. We do of course now also have access to the Vanguard Warlord traits for the Phobos characters, where probably one of the most interesting ones is Master of the Vanguard, which can give you some plus ones to move advance and charging for Phobos units, which is good for getting them into close combat a bit quicker. Could be good paired with some Incursors or something. Next we come to Relics of the Fang, and there are six from the main book, and then we get lots more in Saga of the Beast. From the main book we've got a few boosted weapons, Black Death is a Frost Axe with Strength plus 2, AP minus 2, Damage 1, and an extra D3 attacks, and the Kraken Bone Sword is Strength plus 1, AP minus 4, Damage 1, and B-Roll Wound Rolls. I don't think that either of these are very good unfortunately, due to them only having 1 damage, which just hinders them and makes them not that meaningful against a lot of hard targets. In general you might often be better off with a Power Fist. There's Frost Fury, an interesting Storm Bolter, with AP minus 1 and Flat Damage 2, and if a target's wounded but not killed, then it takes a mortal wound on a 4+, plus. it's also Assault 4. 
a little bit of extra firepower. It could probably pay for itself over the course of a game, but I don't think it will necessarily usually change a game unlike some of the other ones might. The Helm of Durfast is a buff to the Space Wolf character's shooting. It allows them to re-roll hit rolls and ignore cover at range. Unfortunately, you can't really get all that much meaningful shooting on your Space Wolves characters, so unfortunately it's a pass for me. The Armor of Ross is an interesting one. It gives you a 4 plus invul save, and at the start of the fight phase you get to nominate an enemy unit, and that unit will fight last after all of your friendly Space Wolves have. This can actually really be a great sucker punch, but when your opponent is charging with a unit, it means that you can potentially hit them with all of your Space Wolves characters and units that they charged, which could be quite a lot with their heroic intervention rules, and it means that they might have the wind taken straight out of them by a lot of their models getting broken before they get to attack. I do feel it's a bit situational, it's only really any good against armies that have decent close combat already, but when it goes off it can be absolutely powerful and could swing a combat. I really like the Wolfenstone as well, this one's a nice uncomplicated plus one attack buff for nearby Space Wolf units, and this will include the Warlord themselves, so it makes them a bit more of a fighty character, and if you're running alongside some Thunderwolves or Wolfguard, it'll give them an extra attack as well. This really makes things like Wolfguard Terminators far more efficient, and it's a really good solid little close combat buffing relic that you can take on someone who's already buffing their close combat, such as a Wolf Lord or Battle Leader. A very nice little synergy option. Out of the main book relics, the Wolf and Stone is my favourite. We've got a lot more options from the Saga of the Beast. I've talked through all of those in the actual review that I did for the book, so feel free to check that one out if you're interested. But my favourite are the Mastercrafted Weapon to get a damage 4 Thunderhammer or damage D3 plus 1 Power Fist. The Morkai's Teeth Bolts, which are the ones where you can sob out your Bolter's shots for giving your whole army re-roll to wound rolls of 1 against 1 unit, which is really quite a powerful debuff, as it works in both shooting and the fight phase. And the Wolf Tail Talisman, which sort of acts as a mini Collector's Assassin, giving you an 18 inch aura of minus 2 to cast enemy psychic spells. That one's a really solid little buy-in against enemy armies that are spamming psychers. Finally, we come to the Space Wars Tent Pestus discipline, which is one that we have already covered alongside Rune Priests, so if you want a bit more of an in-depth discussion, then go and check out that video. As an overview though, Living Lightnings are smites that can allow it to change into additional units, though not enormously more useful than smites in my opinion. Tempest Wrath is a very decent debuff, you select an enemy unit within 24 inches and they're minus one to hit for the rest of the turn. Murderous Hurricane is an anti-horde sort of smite, where you pick a unit within 18 inches, and then you roll a dice for each model in the unit, each roll of 6 gets you a mortal wound, so it's going to be best against huge units of like 30 orc boys or something. Fury of the Wolf Spirits is the one that soups up the Rune Priest with some additional wolves to help them out in close combat. They get 6 additional attacks with Freki and Jerry, strength 5, AP minus 3, damage 1, wolf bites. This one's really quite fun, and it can make your Rune Priest far more dangerous to hordes in close combat. Stormcaller is a nice defensive buff, though it is pretty hard to cast with a warp charge of 8. You use it, and then any space removes within 6 inches of him gain the benefit of cover. Definitely a lot easier for Njarl Stormcaller, what with his plus 1 to cast mean that he's far more likely to cast it reliably than your standard Rune Priest. Finally, we have Jaws of the World Wolf, where you roll 2d6 and subtract the target's move characteristic, and the target suffers a number of mortal wounds equal to the result. Naturally, pretty tailored to just how slow your target can move. Great against armies like Necrons or units fielding Terminators. This one can be quite a powerful one to command B-roll a low result of this roll. You could potentially be getting quite a lot of other mortal wounds out of it. Overall, my favourite are Tempest Wrath for the minus one to hit, and Stormcaller for the cover though the others certainly have their uses. In Saga of the Beast, we also gained access to the Vanguard Obscuration Discipline for the Phobos Librarian, with a couple of useful options such as Tenebrous Curse to stop enemy units moving quite as quickly, Mind Raid to steal command points, and a few other things that can buff Phobos units, either shrouding them or moving them quickly with Temporal Corridor. And I'd also just like to mention that we also get Litanies of Battle now, Thanks to the Saga of the Beast updated rules, which really helps out our Wolf Priests. In particular, the one that gets plus 2 inches to charge is really important for Space Wolves. They've got quite a lot of units that can come in from Deep Strike or Outflank, and if they're able to meet a Wolf Priest that's already on the table, then they have a far, far greater likelihood of making that all-important charge out of reserve, and actually getting to use all of their fancy close combat abilities. There's all the usual good stuff as well, such as Lithiany of Hate to re-roll hit rolls, and plus 1 to hit and wound in the shooting phase. The Space Wolves also get their unique litany, Tale of the Wolf King and Lord of the Deep, which gives them plus one damage with their melee weapons when they're fighting vehicles and monsters. Again, that one could potentially be a great situational buy-in, and will be absolutely outstanding on something like Wolf Guard or Wolfen. They could be all hitting vehicles with damage for Thunderhammers. 
So that's as brief a summary of Codex Space Wolves that I could give. Of course, we'll be trying to cover some of the other unique data sheets that the book has as we go on over the coming weeks, so feel free to subscribe if you'd like to hear more. Overall, I think that Space Wolves are a really powerful close combat army and have a few of their own interesting shooting tricks that make it a little bit less onerous to include shooting units in them compared with things like Blood Angels, for example. I think their main weakness is the fact that they might struggle to get to close combat, which we did very much discuss in another video, for ways to help them get there. But if they do manage to make it to the enemy, then they will certainly cause a massive amount of pain due to all of these crazy stacking rules, which means that all of their murderous close combat weapons will tear apart the enemy army in short order if enough make it in. Thanks very much for listening to another Allspets Tactics video. Feel free to subscribe for more if you'd like to hear more Space Wolf content. And if you have been enjoying the channel recently, and I do have a Patreon page, which is what keeps the channel going. If you've been watching regularly, then any support is really greatly appreciated, as it's only with the support of the Patreons that I can afford to spend enough time making this much Warhammer 40k content. There's also a few additional perks for Patreon members, such as getting to see some videos early, regular polls to determine what sort of videos will be coming next for the channel, and the occasional prize draw where I post out some free miniatures to a lucky Patreon. If any of that sounds interesting, or you'd just like to help support the channel, then please have a click of the link in the description below and take a look. Of course, a massive thank you to my current Patreons for allowing me to keep this whole thing going. In any case, thank you very much for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.